Over the last 20 years, the same advances in technology that have powered the smartphone revolution have also powered changes in the satellite industry. For years, companies relied on truck-sized satellites that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make. But today, those same satellites can be made orders of magnitude smaller and cheaper. There are satellites orbiting the Earth now that are literally no bigger than a bread box. For those of you who actually know what a bread box is. There are billions of dollars of investment capital being poured into satellites, and that's because they can do lots of useful things. Governments can use them to image natural disasters in order to aid in emergency response. Hedge fund investors can use them to do things like counting cars in parking lots to see what stores are hot this season, or looking at whether oil tankers are moving in and out of refineries to guess oil prices. Law enforcement is even using satellites to track down pirates on the high seas. But this increase in demand for satellites is also driving an increase in demand for rocket launches. After all, the satellites have to get up to space somehow, and we've really only figured out one way to do it. So companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab have been increasing the number of launches they've been doing every year. And with those increases in launches also comes an increase in pollution. That's because rocket fuels are typically composed of things like methane or kerosene, which produce lots of greenhouse gases. But there are companies looking to improve this process, either by making rocket engines more efficient so that they use less fuel, or by changing the fuels entirely so that they produce less carbon emissions. To understand more about the impact of spaceflight on climate change, we talked to experts in aerospace engineering to learn more about the impact of rockets on climate. We've been transitioning in the last 10 years away from these kind of giant monolithic spacecraft, one per rocket and a really big rocket to get it out there with government funding to more of a model of private launch where we have a number of companies that are really kind of competing in the classic capitalist style to try to get a piece of the pie with respect to launching payloads into space. The propellants, which normally include a fuel and an oxidizer, uh, combine and combust. And then those combustion products are forced out the end of the rocket nozzle to provide thrust and propel the rocket into space. No matter what the propellant is, the way that you push a rocket off the launch pad and up into the high speed orbit or escape trajectory that it needs to get away from Earth, you have to push really fast mass out the back of the rocket. And most of it contains some byproducts that contribute to global climate change. You know, one of the most common uh, fuel combinations is what we call RP-1, which stands for rocket propellant one, which essentially is a high grade kerosene. Newer rockets are going to uh, methane as a fuel or liquid natural gas. Liquid natural gas is much cleaner burning Essentially, you don't have any carbon particles or soot. Um, you still get a little bit of CO2, but it's less than if you're burning kerosene. A 2018 report from the Aerospace Corporation found that rocket emissions uniquely impact the stratosphere and could potentially affect the ozone layer, although more study is needed. The report recommends that launch companies and scientists do more to understand these impacts before launches get too numerous. There are a lot of companies in the spaceflight industry working to reduce the impact of rockets on the climate. After all, a lot of rocket scientists were inspired by Star Trek, which is maybe the ultimate in clean energy future. Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin rocket that he used to send William Shatner into space, for example, burned hydrogen and oxygen to output water. There are companies doing other radical sci-fi solutions like Spin Launch, which is building a giant centrifuge in the desert to literally fling satellites into space. Today we're going to be talking with main base Blue Shift Aerospace. Its solution is literally more down to earth, using the power of Mother Nature to make a more sustainable, more efficient rocket fuel. You know, I was born in the early 70s during the Apollo era, and that really set my expectations for what the future would look like and how humanity would be exploring space. Those expectations weren't met for me, and so 
I ultimately pursued a degree in physics and then later in electrical engineering. But my curiosity for the universe and, and exploration was always there. Uh, and I always wanted to find a way to combine technology and benefiting our planet and humanity. And it wasn't until 2012 that I decided that the time was ripe for a new space company. And I wanted to be the next launch company. And I wanted to do it in a green fashion, in a, in a more Earth responsible fashion. So here we are, over 240 engine tests later. We've now launched a small prototype version of our green fuel powered rocket here in Maine. And we're about a year away from launching all the way to space with a commercial payload using a, a cleaner, nearly carbon neutral fuel for the first time in the world. Our rocket technology is a hybrid rocket, which means the, the fuel is a solid and the oxidizer, in this case, is a liquid. The fuel is, we believe, close to carbon neutral. Because of the, the principal ingredient, if I could reveal the principal ingredient, which I can't, you would understand that inherently in the creation of the, of the fundamental ingredient, we're capturing a lot of carbon. There is both complexity and advantages to doing a, a hybrid rocket engine. The benefit is we actually have half the complexity of traditional rocket engines. We also have uh, the advantage that our fuel is inherently very stable. Uh, it is non-explosive. It is safer and less complex than uh, traditional liquid fuel rockets, but there's been far less research done around them over the years. And so we decided to start doing a whole series of engine tests using different mixtures and different blends of biofuels. All of them non-toxic, uh, all of them extremely stable, and all of them uh, non-explosive. For the suborbital rocket, we will shoot for 100% reusability. And then for orbital, our plans are to at least recover the first stage, maybe the second stage. It's a very important part of, of well, the financial plan is to make them as reusable as possible. So when we launched the rocket on January of this year, it was an incredible experience. I think we were all sort of impressed by how very, very little exhaust you could see. This is great. Wow, that sound, I love that sound. This is incredible. What I was surprised by was that this small company in Maine that launched a, a rocket using a bio-derived fuel changed the conversation in about a month after our launch. And since then, I've seen other companies being asked, how are you gonna make your launches more renewable? How are you gonna make it more Earth-friendly? And I think the heat needs to stay on all of us, including our company, and how we can be more uh, sustainable. Space may be the final frontier for business, but Earth is still the only planet that we can live on. But thanks to companies like Blue Shift Aerospace, we may still be able to reach for the stars without heating up the sky.